Majority of the planes that you see flying today are either Airbus or Boeing. Both companies have dominated aerospace manufacturing for half a century, with few competitors coming close. While the US company Boeing, the world leader, has been around since 1916, its European rival Airbus emerged much later. In the years after World War II, American companies dominated the aviation industry and so, in the late 1960s, a consortium of European aerospace manufacturers, then known as Airbus Industry, came together to develop a Challenger. Now, jet travel was opening up the skies and allowing more people to travel further than ever before. Aircraft were becoming more dependable and a call for larger capacity aircraft was being made by airlines. In Europe, it was feared that the market would become dominated by US aircraft manufacturers if there wasn't a timely and cost-effective European offering to combat this. The problem with the European market was that it was fragmented. That is to say that each nation had its own aircraft industry producing for a small market. This meant that any aircraft type produced would have a short production life until the market was saturated, which made it very difficult for a manufacturer to recoup development costs, much less than turn a good profit. So on May the 29th, 1969 at the Paris Air Show, an historic agreement was signed between the French and the Germans. Airbus industry would develop the world's first wide-body twin-engine airliner, the Airbus A300. It was a plane that would launch an empire. It was to be the first product of the company which we know today as Airbus. There were a few couple of innovations that made this plane special. The wide body and raised cabin floor meant it could carry passengers and cargo at the same time, allowing airlines to increase their profitability. The wings gave the plane enough lift to climb faster and attain a level cruise altitude sooner than other passenger aircraft of the time, giving cabin crew more time for the in-flight service. It could hold 270 passengers and with a range of 1,200 nautical miles, it was designed to serve short to medium haul markets. Because it had two engines rather than the standard three, it was lighter and more efficient than the contemporary US rivals, such as the Lockheed L-1011 and the McDonnell Douglas DC-10. Now, construction was a pan-European exercise. The wings were constructed in the UK, then transported to Germany to be fitted with moving services. They were then shipped to nearby Germany, alongside with the rear fuselage sections, were flown to the final assembly line in Toulouse in France. The engines came from the US, the tail assemblies from Spain, while the central wing box and nose were built in France. The road convoy of parts to the assembly line attracted curious crowds, an Airbus tradition that would continue through the decades, with people regularly turning out to see the components arrive for the A380. Now, Air France was the large customer for the Airbus A300, with an order for six planes in September 1970. By the time Air France put their first A300 into service in May of 1974, Airbus was finding it hard to get customers for their launch aircraft. The oil crisis of 1973 caused an aviation downturn, and airlines had trouble filling their existing aircraft at higher prices, demanded by more expensive oil. This put a stop to spending money on newer aircraft, no matter how economical they might be. To broaden the market base, like British pop groups, Airbus knew that it had to break into the North American market. Here, they were fighting against an American perception of European plane makers, that they produced high performance but low dependability products. To highlight the dependability of the A300, Airbus decided to let the world's only wide-body twin-engine airline approve itself to the American doubters. In 1973, the A300 embarked on a six-week tour of North America. To get there, they would fly from Toulouse to Dakar and then via Brazil to Florida. This tour allowed airline executives and financiers to get a first-hand look and feel of the A300. One of those people were the CEO of Eastern Airlines, which was one of the big four in the US. It was, however, becoming evident that the concept of a wide-body short-haul jet might not be what the market was looking for. Airlines who flew the A300 were finding that they were having to reduce the frequency of flights so that they could fill the larger plane. This made the airlines that flew more frequent narrow-body services more popular due to their greater choice of departure times. 
the attraction of wide body comfort was not enough to draw a crowd. Sales were such that production was dropped to one aircraft every two months, with four white-tailed aircraft kept in storage. As we mentioned, sales were slow at the start, and it was unclear whether the European startup would survive. Three engine planes were still the industry standard, and there was skepticism whether two engines could safely carry passengers over long distances. A lifeline appeared in 1977, where the US-based Eastern Airlines gave them a shot by leasing four planes for six months. The company then ended up buying those aircraft and ordering 19 more. Now, a decade after the arrival of the A300, the Airbus family expanded with the A310 taken to the air in 1982 and the A300-600 in 1983. The A310 was a shorter, longer-range aircraft than the 300, seating 218 in a two-class configuration. The A300-600, meanwhile, introduced an improved wing featuring recambered trailing edge. The A300 and the A310 would spawn many variations, but two stand out as the most exciting. There's the Airbus A300-0G, a reduced gravity aircraft used for training astronauts. And then there's the A300-600ST Beluga, a huge whale-shaped cargo freight version of the A300-600 used to transport Airbus parts from factories to the final assembly line. But the great news is, in 1977, the A300B4 became the first ETOPS compliant aircraft. The draw for this with customers was that it qualified for extended twin-engine operations over water, offering more versatility in routing. The CEO of Airbus said in a statement marking the 50th anniversary that Airbus has been a showcase of European integration. While the European project it was unveiled alongside the Concorde has captured the public imagination more, the A300 has made its mark as a reliable workhorse. By the time construction of the A300 ceased in 2007, 561 aircraft had been made. So, the dramatic increase in freight traffic in recent years has resulted in a glut of orders for that dedicated version. FedEx was the first large cargo carrier to see potential of the aircraft by ordering 25 in 1991. The first A300-600 freighter flew in December 1993, with delivery starting in 1994. FedEx then added new orders bringing its total purchase to 42 aircraft, although it maxed out a fleet of 60, having purchased several second-hand examples. As the commercial aviation marketplace changed, and more modern types offered greater efficiency, orders for the A300 began to slow down during the second half of the 1990s. Most of the recent orders have been for the freighter versions, the last passenger airliner being handed over to Japan Air System in November 2002. The final and the 561st production A300, an A300 freighter for FedEx, was delivered on July 12, 2007. So, Airbus has a support package to keep A300s flying commercially until at least 2025, some 50 years beyond the first coming of the production line.